Hey everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Andrew Weber. I'm the Director of Insights over here at Take a Metrics, and we're going to be talking about getting the budget you need to, uh, to really get ready for Q4. And uh, really excited today to be joined by Sellers Funding uh, and Ricardo here. Um, and uh, just before we kind of get started uh, for, for real, wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping notes as people kind of come in the door a little bit, give the people a minute or two to get out of the last meetings uh, and, and hit the link here. But just first off, this webinar is being recorded and you will be receiving a replay of this webinar roughly 24 hours after the completion of this. And you'll also get the full slide deck so you can kind of review in how, uh, whatever format makes the most sense for you. And uh, additionally, you'll see a little question box, I believe, you know, depending on the browser you're using, it'll either be at the bottom or side of your screen. Uh, and really, at any point during the presentation, if you have a question, which is either myself or Ricardo talking about something, you have a follow-up question, enter in the question box. Uh, we'll see that and we'll get to as many questions as we can uh, at, the end of the at the end of the webinar. But again, you don't have to wait till the end of the uh, presentation to ask those questions. You can do it at any time and we'll, we'll receive them. So, so just be aware of that. So uh, with that, I'd love to just um, you know, introduce uh, Ricardo Perro, and if uh, Ricardo, if you could tell a little, us a little bit about yourself, uh, and then we'll hop into the content. Sure. Well, thanks, Andrew, for for having uh, us here. Uh, so, about myself, I've been uh, in uh, the financial financial industry for uh, way more than I want to admit, but uh, I'd say over a decade. And I've been, uh, we founded Sellers Funding about four years ago. Uh, so excited to be here um, uh, and, and share some of, of these insights about Q4 uh, with, with our audience. Great. Yeah, so, so really excited. I think this is going to be a good one. Again, there's no time like the present to get ready to, for Q4. It's never early enough, uh, it seems like. So I think this is uh, obviously a little bit what we'll talk about here uh, as we get through. So let's just get right into it. So first, we're going to be going through a variety of reasons why your business may need that additional capital as you start planning for Q4. Kind of there's, there's a variety of reasons you might need this. So we're going to go over those in a little bit more detail. And, you know, from the take a metric side, we're going to dive in a little bit on the advertising front. So specifically, how does the cost of advertising change during Q4? We're going to be going through a variety of uh, different data points there to kind of give you some perspective there uh, and potentially, right, reasons why you may be reconsidering kind of what your cost basis is going to be like just on the advertising front alone uh, as we hit Q4 uh, in a few months. Then, you know, going to pass over to Carter, who's going to be going in a little bit more detail about financing options. So for you as a seller, what are the options out there for you that you could take advantage of and, you know, why they might make sense for a certain type of business and, and others, what situations would dictate that? And then we'll kind of wrap up with real world examples, right? What are examples that, that maybe you can take with you that maybe you see yourself in of sellers that have kind of leveraged additional capital, especially in that kind of critical Q4 period, to really grow their business, and why was that capital necessary, right? So we'll go into that a little bit, and then we'll, again, wrap up with Q&A. And as I mentioned kind of earlier, for folks that maybe came in a little late, at any point in their presentation, please pop in that question in that little question box, either on the bottom or side of your screen. We'll get to them uh, as many as we can at the very end. Uh, and yet again, we're going to be recording this webinar, so you'll get a full replay of this in your email inbox along with the slide deck. So, so keep an eye out for that as well. Okay, so, so first off, I want to give you a quick overview of Take a Metrics. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we're a technology platform uh, where you can use us either just uh, by yourself, by a SaaS product, or we also have, if you need that extra hands-on keyboard help, we have teams of expert analysts that can kind of help be that, you know, boots on the ground help to kind of scale you across marketplaces, specifically Amazon and Walmart. And uh, we kind of pair this with uh, not just like advertising artificial intelligence, it's really gonna help maximize your, your bidding effectiveness, but then also provide market intelligence services so you understand where you're showing up in search, where your competitors are, and being able to leverage that as well. Uh, so here you see some of the brands we work with, um, and you know these some of the larger ones we work with, everyone from, again, some of the top players in their space all the way down to smaller sellers. So there's really a range of, uh, of folks we work with here. 
And, uh, you know, Ricardo, if you can tell us a little bit about Sellers Funding for the folks on the line. Sure. Uh, so Sellers Funding, uh, as, as the name says, uh, probably uh, we, we, we start our business as a, a lender to Amazon sellers. Uh, we are evolving, uh, and I'll, I would say now we we became a, a fully uh, digitalized financial platform supporting e-commerce merchants. Uh, we have connectivities uh, with with Amazon, Walmart, eBay, Shopify, Magento, Miva, so you know a, a number of of platforms. We we have over twenty five thousand registered users in our platform. And we provide not only working capital solutions, but also payments, uh, global collections accounts, VAT services, and so on. So it's it's a fully integrated plat financial platform for e-commerce sellers. Great. Okay, so let's get into it. Why your business may need that additional capital as we enter Q4. So you know, Ricardo, if you can kind of talk a little bit more on you know these first couple of bullets around, especially fulfillment supplier issues, because I think those are some top of mind for a lot of sellers. Yeah, uh, I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, well, unfortunately, since COVID, uh, with everything that happened, we saw e-commerce taking off, but with with the increase in activity, also we saw an increase in challenges related to logistics, relationship to suppliers, Amazon imposing new uh rules uh and uh for for uh, sellers to to use the fba system so everything became more uh, i would say expensive and complex to deal with logistic issues and that requires a better uh better relationship with your suppliers uh and having the liquidity at hand to properly um uh, explore opportunities when you have the opportunity to to, to secure a shipment uh, immediately when you have a good uh, negotiation going on with a supplier related to pricing or terms of payments uh, this is extremely important so uh, the landscape changed in 2019 and we just came back from prosper and that was the number one comment among all our clients that's how difficult and expensive things became, especially in 2021. Yeah, we're definitely hearing the same thing. And I mean, you know, everyone's dealing, or a lot of people are still dealing with these issues that they thought maybe were just, oh, they're, they'll be for six months as we start of 2020 and they've keep blasted on and on. Obviously, you know, as we're kind of all figuring out, you know, FBA is permanently changed. I don't think, you know, it's not going back to what it was three, four years ago. That's just, this is just the way it is. It's going to be more restrictive and there's going to be more strings attached to getting your products listed on there. Uh, which which brings up those challenges and i mean you know beyond that uh you can kind of see a graph here this is you know you can use this as a, as a proxy for e-commerce as a whole this is from marketplace pulse they were looking at specifically the number of sellers live on walmart marketplace and what you saw is really as you hit 2020 and that has not slowed down if anything it's borderline accelerating as we enter 2021 the number of sellers coming up coming live on walmart.com went from this kind of steady uptick to just this almost exponential rise yep. and you're seeing similar things happen on, on amazon just because obviously the growth is there you're seeing more sellers uh decide hey this is the time, the time to jump in with, with with my products and that creates challenges it creates obviously within your own vertical there's more competitors it means advertising costs likely are going to go up even with the increase in activity so just this is something to really be aware of and this is across marketplaces and yep. Additionally, you know, worth pointing out, you know, Amazon is is looking to kind of put different emphases in this new world of okay, we know they their advertising products is very mature now. They're trying to find other ways to engage shoppers and, and things like their their social promotions, particularly around Amazon Live. They're trying to really promote these among sellers, but that takes additionally some capital to spin up and get those to, to a point where you're really cranking on those and those are making some impact. We even know Amazon is, you know, potentially using these to right, impact, uh, impact your, your search rank or your discoverability. So these are things you may want to take into account, especially during Q4. Let's say you're launching a new product. Uh, you know, you want to take advantage of everything at your disposal to make that product a success during that period when you know conversions are going up, you know the volumes there. Uh, you know, do you have uh, everything on hand to make that a reality to put your best foot forward? 
And, uh, you know, R Ricardo, if you can kind of go on a little bit about, you know, when you think about this fulfillment and supplier challenges, you know, how that really should, should think about your, how you should think about your costs in that context. Yeah, if you think about the Q4, um, starting from, from how, the, what does that represent for your annual sales, right? Uh, in general, uh, about 40% of retail sales uh, in the U.S. happen in, in the last quarter of the year. And that's no different for e-commerce and, and for our client base. So having a plan and a budget in place is extremely important to face uh, that specific time of the year. Um, you will see a spike in, in freight costs. Uh, probably challenges in, in, in timing from, from purchase order to, to delivery time. So having a good relationship with, with your suppliers, having good terms of payment with your suppliers is key. And uh, I think that uh, having the liquidity in place, the proper capital in place, is key to, to set good terms uh, with not only suppliers, but vendors in, in, in general. Um, I believe that um, as as you will see uh, throughout uh, this the next six months, uh, we're going to see um, more and more uh, high quality sellers uh, ordering um, from their suppliers ahead of their competitors because the competition, like you said, is fierce, is increasing. So. The sooner you you make that purchase order, the better for you. It's going to add uh, marginally uh, into your financial costs, but the benefits of having making sure that you have the proper inventory for sale in the fourth quarter is key. Yeah, that's a that's a huge issue. I mean, you know, for for some context, you know, what what you don't want is obviously getting a situation where your you know what you're dealing with a, a lower than expected inventory, which is gonna hamper your ability to grow, uh, obviously, you know, over the course of Q4. And I mean, and obviously you don't wanna go out of stock, you know, that can impact your business, you know, going forward for months. So, uh, especially on a marketplace like Amazon. So yeah, I, those, are, those are terrific points. And I mean, moving to the advertising front, what's likely gonna happen is you're gonna see ad costs are gonna likely jump vis-a-vis -vis what was you know maybe you're used to over the course of the year more than than what you're 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 expecting uh if you're kind of looking at maybe you know the past few years uh so so we'll, we'll kind of go into that data in just a bit uh but that's definitely something to keep an eye on that if you're kind of expecting okay look at how much my ad costs grew during q4 in 2019 2018 2017 and even 2020 keep in mind that that you may see that that trend accelerate especially on on marketplaces like amazon and walmart and and as I mentioned before, especially for your key products, so you, let's say you're launching products, so this is a very critical product for your, uh, for your company in Q4 to, to really drive sales volume, you may want to factor in the cost of Amazon Live production. Now, I will say the asterisk here is more for the fact that you may not see that direct like, uh, you know, okay, people saw this and they bought. Now, Amazon's going to try to bring that up as much as you can. But what Amazon is, is trying to do uh, and, and we'll see how this kind of flushes out over the next you know, few months. Is they're trying to really prioritize brands that are putting out this type of content, this type of, kind of socialized content on their site, again, through some boosts in search and boosts on, on certain pages. So this may have some impact kind of downstream. Again, maybe worth testing on some really key products, uh, but there is a cost associated with that. You want good production value, you want this to, to showcase, and that may cost you know, in, the, in, the, in the five figure range, maybe even more, uh, depending on the size of your brand. So just uh, be aware this is something that, that may be an additional cost and maybe something that could be added to your business in Q4. So going into the ad costs a little bit uh, deeper, I, you know, this is a great, uh, you know, this is a report that we did following the holiday season in 2020. And we looked at specifically during Cyber Week, which obviously is the most, you know, the heaviest trafficked uh, for the most part, depending on your vertical, the heaviest traffic portion of the holiday season. And we looked at the CPCs on Amazon during Cyber Week versus the week prior. We looked at this over two years. So we looked at this for the week prior in 2019 versus Cyber Week and week, uh, Cyber Week in 2020 versus the week prior. And what you saw is that across verticals, CPCs jumped 
But notice that this wasn't pervasive where 2020 was vastly more expensive than 2019, right? In some cases, 2019, like for beating personal care, right, was much more expensive, or at least the, the, the increase in CPCs was, was much larger in 2019 than 2020. Now, I think 2020 is a unique case. I think, you know, how people were behind potentially in 2020 was maybe a little different than prior years. So there's a little bit of that. But this kind of brings up the, the idea that your expectations cannot be just looking at prior years and thinking, just carry that over to this year, right? Buying behavior on the, on the part of consumers has changed. Now, how much it reverts back to, let's say, pre-pandemic behavior is, is, is anyone's guess. However, there, you know, these habits that people have, have kind of grown into over this past year and a half, a lot of these have become ingrained, uh, right? You think about even the work from home era, which obviously there's more flexibility there, et cetera. So beating personal care as an example, right? Where something where it's like, well, I know I'm going into work every day. I need, you know, X, Y, and Z makeups, right? If I'm not going into work every day, maybe I don't need those, right? Buying behavior has potentially changed. So keep in mind, just what you want to do is really keep your finger on the pulse of how are things evolving now? And how are those tracking? And you want to make those decisions kind of as you see them, really, as you see them occurring, where are you seeing conversions? Where are you seeing costs kind of rise maybe more precipitously than you were expecting? Is that worth it? You know, really considering the value of the products, the value per click. It's something that we, at Take a Metrics we really take into account as we kind of set up your, your account. These are really critical considerations, but just don't rely on priors only because it's going to put you in a bad spot. But you should be expecting a lot more activity. Now, bring this home, let's look at a little more current data. So this is something this is uh, from Marketplace Pulse. They're kind of looking just network wide across kind of, uh, you know, there's this wider swath of, of Amazon uh, sellers that they were kind of monitoring and looking at the average cost per click of Amazon ads, again, with, just within the U.S., but looking at this kind of month over month over the past, uh, you know, year plus. And what you found is that you can kind of see it generally here, but there is a bit of an acceleration. As we hit 2021, those ad costs, you kind of started, you, you know, you saw a dip kind of right during the heat of the pandemic, as it were, when there was supply constraints, not surprisingly, right, it meant that ads were, ad budgets were kind of pulled back, so you'd expect a little bit of a dip. But those rises have been pretty steady, and now they've started to pick up to the point where between February and this past month, you saw an average of 7% increases month over month on CPCs. Now, obviously, this is going to vary by vertical. Certain verticals will be more, certain verticals will be less. But that, that's, that's a big number when you're looking month over month. Now, how you look at that, how does that continue through December, you know, we, we shall see, but that's that's definitely a trend you want to watch, and you, you, you know you're potentially in a position where those CPCs between earlier this year and by the time we reach Q4 could be, could be like 50% higher, right? That that's a that's a real possibility, and you need to be prepared for that. Do you have the capital on hand where if you're looking to scale, you'll be you'll still be able to advertise? You're not going to be right. Okay, well I can only go, you know on certain products and I maybe can't do, you know, you, you need to be able to scale. This is, we talked about those old habits becoming, uh, you know, ingrained. Shopping online is becoming one of those. People are, the volume is gonna be there. You need to have the cash on hand to even with these expected costs, you're likely gonna see more conversion. It's likely, you know, probably gonna be worth it for you. They gotta do so intelligently, but be prepared for those type of costs. So, I mean, with, with, with that, you know, again, ask yourself, are you prepared for those retail ad CPCs to ride as roughly 50% by December? Now, right, you need to be able to optimize, right? So it's not, you need to drive efficiencies, right? It's not just, okay, I'm gonna spend 50% more and, and great, right? I mean, you, you might need to do that, but you wanna get the most for your money. Uh, and a lot of that is, can you bid to value, right? Are you able to put a system in place? This is something Tickometrics does, but, but something you, know, you can do elsewhere, but where you're associating a value associated with a click, which should be right more when, if, let's say, it's a competitor keyword or a category keyword that you know is high volume, and lower when it's your own branded keyword and you're expecting someone to buy uh, anyway, even if it was organic. Right? You need to be able to to bid effectively, so you're bidding based on that value of the click, uh, and and that's how you drive a little bit greater efficiency there, especially in these environments where you know costs are going to be higher. And another thing that we're seeing more and more advertisers do even now, uh, and something that's really paying dividends is seeding audiences prior to those critical seasons where they're using, uh, for example, the Amazon DSP is a, is a great example of this. Uh, you can use also Amazon sponsored display, but where, okay, you can kind of target folks based on uh, 
their kind of purchase history. So things like, like interest groups, like new moms is an example. And you're able to get your product in front of them uh, on a CPM basis uh, and give yourself that exposure prior to the holiday season, build those audiences uh, and, and help you can kind of convert them down the line. Uh, so this, this is really important kind of because you're looking to scale and especially if you're thinking about new products, right? New, new products on Amazon, especially considering this really increased level of competition, you need to drive volume early so that you're actually ranking organically. You're, you're also providing the ability that I can show Amazon. We're driving conversions. You should place me or you should give me priority to place my ad or even organically on relevant keywords. Uh, but keep in mind, I think, you know, uh, especially Amazon DSP, there's a higher minimum. Uh, you know, if you work directly with Amazon, I believe it's 35K. If you work with someone like us, uh, that, that minimum can be much lower uh, initially. Amazon sponsored display, uh, that's also a lower minimum. However, there's a little bit less degree of control you've got. Uh, so th these are worth questions considering kind of, especially if you've got new products or it's a really critical period for you, really look into this because it can help you scale as we hit, as we keep for in particular. Okay, so we've talked about all these costs and these all the potential cost centers there. So Ricardo's gonna talk about kind of the financing options. Okay, so you think I might need more capital or, or I'm thinking I, you know, that, that's something I, I need to think about what are those options out there for you? Yeah, I'm going to start talking about uh, one of the, the, the topics that you mentioned in the previous slide. When you scale a new product and you scale fast, most likely Amazon will hold your payments. Uh, we, I just had a call with one of our clients. Uh, he has $80,000 in receivables being held by Amazon. Amazon will pay him like $25,000 because he's growing too fast completely new, new line of, of products. So the daily advance can be a great solution for that. When you sign up for the daily advance with us, um, that unpaid balance is immediately released uh, to your bank account. So this is a solution that can free up cash, cash immediately uh, and you can negotiate in terms of paying that that money back in two, three, six months and have the data advance running immediately. Um, we can advance up to 90% in US dollars, in Canadian dollars, uh, in pounds and Australian dollars. So we are already working with all these marketplaces and soon we'll be opening to Europe. So if you are a US seller selling abroad, you can actually uh, do that in a very simple uh, transaction where you sign up for the daily advance and that immediately you have the option to convert all your foreign sales back into dollars on a daily basis with both the FX and the advance uh, rate embedded into one single fee. That's a great solution. We have a lot of foreign sellers uh, selling the US and, and using that tool and also U.S. sellers selling abroad using that to the reverse flow. The credit limit, the credit limit, uh, you can qualify for up to $5 million for that credit, that credit limit. Uh, and we have a, a promotion. Actually, that is a reflection of what we heard from, from uh, our clients at Prosper. We usually offer up to 90 days interest only period for the credit limit. So, you sign up now and you, you uh, only start amortizing your first withdrawal after 90 days. Given everything that is happening in the logistics front, we are extending to 120 days. This is a special offer for all the attendees that uh, are listening to this webinar uh, and we will follow up on, on, on the webinar material later on. That, uh, that credit limit, you're not um, obliged to, to perform a full withdrawal, you have the ability to perform multiple withdrawals under that credit limit. So if you just need 20% um, down payment now to secure that, that, that inventory with your supplier, you can withdraw only 20% now and withdraw the balance when you receive the merchandise uh, uh, for shipping. And each withdrawal, you, you can define the term. So if you think that you're going to have the liquidity to pay it back by January, you can select uh, a shorter amortization period. 
If you want to, to go all the way to 12, 18 months, let us know, work with your account manager. We can select a, a longer period of time. There is no prepay, prepayment penalty for any uh, transaction with us. So those are the two options that we are really, really popular uh, within Amazon and Walmart sellers. Great, yeah, and, and to uh, Ricardo's point, we're gonna be sending along a, a link to the specific offer within the follow-up, so everyone will receive that uh, so you can access this. So let's go through examples of successful capital during Q4. And I know Ricardo, kind of, you're gonna talk about uh, you know, someone, especially using your service to really scale up. So I think that's a, that's a great example kind of ask after we just talked through some of those options. Yeah, let's, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Gumi Kid. They sell uh, children's apparel and baby supplies. They saw a huge demand uh, surge in, uh, for, for their products. And they, they had to, to, to work uh, to, to secure a uh, steady source of funds uh, to secure their inventory purchases. Um, we end up funding them uh, in, in 24 hours and they are now uh, able to maintain that optimal stock uh, inventory level regardless of, of, uh, of the, the timing and seasonality. Um, they've been planning uh, early, and basically, basically, if you if you turn the page, uh, they created a track record with us. Uh, so you saw that in 2020 they sold thirty thousand uh, dollars. They sold no. They secured a thirty thousand dollar credit facility with us. This year, based on their growth and the, uh, their planning, uh, and I think that they, they did an amazing job they qualify for $400,000. So you can see the growth, you can see how we work with them in, in, in that growth, supporting that growth. Yeah, it's a, it's a great example of kind of just, you know, staying ahead and, and, and putting yourself in the best position. I mean, and, and building on this, and moving even beyond Amazon. This was specifically a Walmart example, but, but very, very relevant. So this is, this is Better Body Foods, Kind of a, a, a boutique, uh, very like organic oriented uh, food brand, and what they were looking to do specifically on on, on Walmart was they've kind of seen plateauing growth. Okay, how can they drive sales volume really and start you know capturing market share as it were? And so a couple things we did. So on the capital side, they're spending more, but they're getting smarter about how they're doing that spending. So when they're working with us, it was really let's let's take the most important 50 products and restructure their campaigns uh, so that it's, okay, we'll be very conservative and then kind of slowly bid shade up so that we're kind of really hitting that optimum mark with our bid to capture conversions at the, essentially the lowest price possible. Because if, you, if unlike Amazon, right, Walmart's a first price auction. So you really wanna make sure you're hitting as low as you can, right? Because Amazon, right, you could bid $10, but if your next biggest competitor only spends, is only bidding $1.10, you're only spending $1.11. Right. With Walmart, if I bid $10, I'm going to pay $10, assuming I win that. So you need to be a little bit, you have to take a, kind of a different bid exploration strategy here. Uh, so additionally, right, we're then using also looking at how we're doing key, from a keyword match perspective. So we said, okay, let's use broad and phrase match to kind of cast a wide net. But then once we find out what returns were really driving uh, sales volume, now we're going to take those, we're going to do exact match and we can bid much more effectively and, and more strategically on those terms specifically. Uh, so, and this is something unique to Walmart, uh, and this is gonna be the webinar next week, we're actually talking with them, so if you wanna tune for that one. But this is really interesting, something Walmart offers that Amazon does not, which is bid multipliers on specific platforms. So if you see, when they report on, let's say, how many sales are getting from, from mobile versus desktop, as an example. If you're finding there's a big split there, Wow, mobile is, is, is much better performing than desktop, especially for this key term and this key product. You can bid specifically with a multiplier on that platform to say, okay, well, if it's a mobile impression, I wanna bid more on that potential click uh, because I know that that's more likely to convert, I'm getting more volume with that. So that's, a, and, and they were finding this, this same thing. So we were able to kind of double down on those specific areas where there's really platform specific component where we could uh, make, a, uh, make a play there and drive volume. And again, this was paired, not just the strategy, but also let's take this and let's double down. Let's put more money in so that we're gonna get the most out of this more you know, efficient spending, this, this better strategy. 
So what you kind of see here is, okay, these numbers are based on the change from Q2 2020. And this is, you know, you look at Q4, Q3 and Q4 here. So we implemented the strategy and their budget went up, but look at like kind of Q4, they really raised their budget up, but you see this really, you know, this is about their, their okay, we've learned more, we're, we're getting more efficient and now let's double down. Let's put more money in because you know the performance is there. And what's really, I think that the best stat about this is look at that growth in just total units sold. It's not tracking just with ad sales, right? It's actually outpacing that. So really you see there's this knock on effect when it comes to advertising. And this is why you really want to be, you know, able to, to kind of effectively capitalize yourself so that you can take advantage of this, uh, you know, during these critical periods. And this has really knock on effects, not just on your ad sales, but on your organic sales as well. This is across Amazon and Walmart. Uh, and so this is, you know, this is a great example of how you, you, know, you spend more and you spend more efficiently. You're, you're going to get more out of it. Uh, so make sure you put yourself in that position. And just some, so before we get to Q&A, I think, you know, it, it's helpful to kind of go through some, some final takeaways. And then again, we're, we're going to get into uh, the question and answer session. Uh, you know, and, and, and Ricardo, you know, feel free to jump in here. I think it's, you know, we talked about this earlier, but, you know, the earlier, the better. You know, do your prep work now. So that you're just you you can you know factor in the fact that things may take time you may need to write do some extra leg work you know planning wise you know obviously it's like you're talking about the funding it can be in your bank account in 24 hours but there's likely there's there's things you have to do before you get there to really find out okay what do you need to do yeah yeah and, you know uh, go, go ahead sorry no uh, like you said and there are. We've been talking a lot about supplier relationships, but uh, there are so many aspects now that will be uh, impacting your margins, like uh, ad cost going up, fulfillment challenges, um, and, and delays on product uh, delivery. So, you know, be prepared and have the adequate capital to, to, to support that phase because it's going to be needed. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and we were talking about they've had a prior webinar with with Deliver, and, and their big thing was right. They're seeing more folks come to them because things like FBA have become less reliable, and you're seeing more and more uh, folks looking for that kind of 3PL option, just at least as a fallback. But that takes time to implement. You know, if you're thinking, hey, maybe I need to look into this, it's like there that takes time to to spin up and get that in a good place. So it's like get that stuff rolling now. Uh, and also then that'll also illuminate, hey, wh what do I need from a capital perspective to make that a reality? Uh, and, and again, on the advertising front, these costs are going to go up and you want to be able to not be, not be caught by surprise if those advertising costs go up and now suddenly you're having to seed ground to competitors because I can't bid as high, I can't be as aggressive as I need to be. And that can really hamper your sales growth. If right, to Ricardo's point, if right, you're having a hefty percentage of your sales that you're relying on in Q4, you don't want to be in the position where it's I can't spend enough to get the marketing necessary to, to actually convert those to sales. Uh, and, you know, on the more optimization front, you know, really, uh, you know, working with someone like us, we can help you do this. But even outside of that, clean up your campaign structure now, especially on, on places like Walmart and Amazon. You taking that more optimized frame where it's like I'm going to take a many to one structure, where I'm going to have an auto campaign where I can kind of see how performance goes. And then if performance is good, I'm going to move those keywords over to manual so I can bid more effectively on them. That's something you should be doing now. And that does take time to get into uh, practice, especially if you have a wider product catalog uh, and kind of get those muscles working uh, as an organization. But this really works. Like we've seen this kind of statistically where if you have a campaign that's working automatic, a lot, there's a lot of sellers out there, you'd be surprised how many, that if someone's working automatic, they just leave it because they're like, oh, it's working great. I don't need to touch it. But you find that unequivocally, if you take a keyword and you move it from an automatic campaign into a manual campaign, it performs better. You get more conversions. You're able to essentially drive greater value out of those keywords. So really think about having that type of structure where you're moving for, as you see appropriate volume come in, you see good conversion rates coming, you're able to move those keywords over to a manual campaign and bid more effectively. And this kind of brings up the point that when you see performance rising, it can be tempting, I think in some cases to be like, oh, I don't want to touch anything, it's doing great. But it's really important, and we're seeing the most effective advertisers on Amazon and Walmart do this, which is when you see performance rising, that's the time to be, I want to invest more, I want to get more aggressive, because I'm seeing conversion rates go up and seeing conversion volume go up. 
your competitors are likely seeing the same thing if they're any, winning any, any uh, placements on them. So you need to get out ahead of them. You need to be more aggressive on those keywords that are driving volume at good, good conversion rates. And those are really, you know, you can look at ROAS, but ROAS can sometimes be a little misleading because it's kind of a downstream statistic. If you're seeing that conversion rate and conversion volume go up, that's the time to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put more money towards that. And that can kind of be a leading indicator. Uh, and, and without ROAS, it can kind of sometimes lead you astray where you're, you're worried a little bit too much about efficiency and, and instead about growth. So uh, this is something that we always kind of, uh, a lot of our algorithms based on this is that we wanna really be mindful of if we're driving growth, we're focused on sales volume and conversion rate. And that's what's gonna guide our uh, ability to be more or less aggressive is what we're seeing that. So this is something to keep in mind. And so with that, I think we can kind of move to questions. Um, and uh, it looks like there's, there's a few in there already. Um, Ricardo, maybe we'll get started with this one for you. Um, this is, what are the minimum require, requirements to qualify for funding? Sure, for the daily advance, we need three months. For the credit limit, we need six months of sales. Um, and, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll take a look on, on each case. Uh, usually we, we tend to target uh, a minimum of twenty thousand dollars for for the credit limit, uh, but we we have the flexibility to work with all size sellers. We we have clients that started with twenty, like like I showed in the example. We started with thirty, grew to four hundred thousand. So we have many many cases uh, where we saw that growth throughout you know 12, uh, 12, 24 months period. Great. Is that similar? I guess we had another question, kind of. Uh... Specifically, kind of for the loan with with a draw option, is there uh, kind of some requirements there? The draw uh, options, no. Uh, you what you have, um, all our clients they cap they, they keep their tokens connected, so we can monitor their sales. We have a, a, a sales forecast model based on like machine learning. I don't want to get into the the details, but what that model uh, estimates is your future sales for the following three, six, 12 months. So as you grow, we can easily adjust on a monthly basis the size of your credit limit. And that model also captures seasonality. So um, for this, uh, and we have a lag, a lag time between 90 to 120 days between purchase order and sale. And the model captures that. So we try to anticipate and make that credit limit larger ahead of the high uh, sales season. Great, uh, it looks like we have a question. This one seems like it's more, more for me. So uh, did you see the same behavior on Amazon Mexico? So we don't have data specifically on the Mexican market, uh, but this was actually a, a webinar we did uh, last week, uh, actually from Prosper uh, with Algo Plus. It was specifically focused on, on the Mexican market and, you know, Listen, I think one of the things, uh, you know, you're definitely seeing similar trends now, the degree to which, you know, for instance, the vertical trends are going to be reflected in the Mexican market is going to vary. But what I would say is that overwhelmingly, we're seeing a collection of clients, regardless of where they're, they're selling, is they're seeing increased activity and you're seeing increased competition. Now, again, the degrees to which, you know, you're going to have to watch your own. I think the biggest thing that, you know, we recommend with, with, our, with our sellers is you know, don't rest on your laurels and don't rely on priors. You know, you have to look at what's happening within your own data and how that's tracking. And it should illuminate kind of, okay, uh, you know, you're not alone here. Those trends are going to be seen by, by your same competitors when it comes to just, are you seeing volume increase? Are you seeing competition increase? Are you seeing the CPCs increase in, in tandem? Uh, you know, watch those and keep track of those and make adjustments because it's not, you know, nothing about Amazon is static. Uh, and especially when it comes to driving performance, it's all about those little tweaks you can make on a product by product, term by term basis to get yourself a little bit more efficient or in, in certain, certain cases, really try to put your foot on the gas to drive growth. So, uh, you know, those trends are going to vary by, by vertical. We don't have anything specific on Mexico, but something where you're going to see something, you know, uh, at, at a high level, those trends are pervasive. And we've seen those, uh, you know, at, at a high level across uh, geographies. Um, so going back to you, Ricardo, I have this one. So it's a uh, I sell on Amazon and Shopify. Will both be considered when determining how much uh, capital I qualify for? Yes, 
So the beauty of our platform is if you sell on multiple platforms, Walmart, Amazon, Shopify, eBay, we'll be able to consolidate your sales in a single report, and we will provide you with a credit limit reflecting your consolidated sales, not only across platform, but also across countries. Awesome, that's great. And uh, so this is a question, and I guess this one's more for, for me, is uh, you showed Walmart seller growth gaining steam, how competitive is it vis-a-vis -vis Amazon? So uh, this is kind of interesting. So I think you know Walmart has gotten much more competitive, but even with all that, it's still not quite as competitive as Amazon, where really like the number of, of sellers on Amazon is substantially more than on Walmart, even again, if you just look at US, which is obviously where Walmart is uh, based. Um, that so the competition there is heating up, but it's still you know relatively early days. That if essentially you get in there, you're going to see that just generally the number of sellers you're competing with, especially for top of search on key terms, is going to tend to be a little bit less than what you're dealing with on Amazon. So uh, that's I think something to really be mindful of if you're kind of on the fence about getting live on Walmart, which also might be an additional capital expenditure as you're kind of trying to scale up inventory to kind of service a new channel. Uh, but keep in mind that, yeah, Walmart is one of these places where there's still room to grow at kind of rates potentially, depending on your vertical, uh, where you're going to get slightly more efficient than Amazon. Uh, but again, maybe, you know, the traffic obviously also to Walmart is not as high just generally. So, so there's, there's plus and minuses there. You got to, you know, main line is where where are your customers going you know and, and and a lot of the times they are going to both sites but it really depends if you're more of a niche product maybe it's more on one or the other uh but definitely competition level is a little different um so this is another question uh for you ricardo it's uh, do funds have to be used for a specific purpose no uh we usually uh, see the bulk of our lending uh towards uh, inventory purchase but we also have clients that are using our prepaid card to pay for their advertising costs outside of the amazon uh, space uh, um, uh, so i would say inventory purchases and advertising are the two leading uh, expense items uh, that are where where we see our clients borrowing uh, to spend money to and I think this is the final question that we can probably uh, finish up a little early. Uh, it's can you give some examples of more efficient advertising practices on Amazon? So uh, I think you know when you talk efficiency on Amazon, it's you know we talked about the the campaign structure. That's one. Additionally, there's a couple of things you can do to just make your uh, advertising practices show a little bit more efficient. I think the first one is understanding the difference between your brand terms, your category terms, and your competitor terms. It can be really tempting if you're looking at a, just a pure ROAS basis or a pure ACOS basis, branded terms look great because can people convert on them, right? I've got it, but I'm advertising on my own branded term. So the issue is, is that uh, incremental? So it may look efficient as the case of like ACOS, but are you taking a sale that you're paying for a sale that you might've gotten organically anyway? Now you need to do brand defense and you kind of got to figure out that middle ground there. You don't want competitors to come and obviously steal your sales. However, you don't want to also bid too high where you're winning. We've seen examples where uh, you look at a brand term and the, the same brand has placed one, two, three, even more ads on that page. And so they're, and, and they're doing this with their most popular products, which are likely going to be the, the, the product the customer is going to buy anyway. So instead, what we always recommend, especially with newer products, if you're really looking to drive volume and, and get that additional benefit down the line, is focus really hard on high traffic category terms you can get that uh that data through amazon retail analytics and other services uh but and you know things like our market intelligence service on what uh, are driving really the highest volume and those are the ones where yes they're a little bit more expensive but those are the ones that are going to drive the most volume have the most value to your business and you can be uh you know still drive efficiencies if you're bidding to value uh appropriately uh competitor terms obviously also going to be more expensive but it's naturally an incremental sale. You're taking away from competitor. But we see a lot of times when we're doing audits of, of uh, you know, folks coming from, from other services or having come from with no advertising really experience and they're kind of doing it for themselves, these branded terms are, are usually heavily over-invested 
because they see, oh, it's efficient. I should put a lot of my budget, but actually what you're doing is rather than you're still defending your brand, but you're actually paying for a lot more sales you don't need to pay for. So that's something we usually, you know, it's one of the first things that we come in. And it's definitely something that you should think about capitalizing for the holidays. Look at those category terms and think about what you're paying for those category terms. And that's where your growth is going to be. So, you know, try to calculate what's that going to take to drive my products up that chart on those category terms uh, and get those conversions. So I think with that, uh, we can probably wrap it up, but this was, uh, this was terrific. And, uh, you know, everyone gets 10 minutes back to their day, which I think everyone could probably use. So, uh, Ricardo, thanks for hopping on. This is great. And uh, again, for everyone online, you'll get a full replay of this uh, presentation along with the full slide deck. So you've got to review at your leisure. Uh, and then along with that offer that uh, Ricardo mentioned or early in the presentation, you'll get a link to that as well. So you can take advantage of that's uh, something of interest. So. With that, we're going to wrap it up. I hope you can tune in next week for the Walmart webinar. Uh, and thanks again, Ricardo, for hopping online. Oh, thank you.